presentations to show you today. I don't even have any slides to show you, so this is low-tech in many ways. I grew up in southern Indiana in the 1970s. I had a very idyllic childhood in many senses. I spent a lot of time on my bike. I spent a lot of time all along the Ohio River Plain. But my home away from home was the public library. And I suppose it's appropriate because not only was I a voracious reader, but the public library even looked like my home. It was on the same block as the house I grew up in. And it was constructed out of the same wire cut dark red bricks as my parents' house, and it had the same Spanish tile roof that my parents' house did. And I spent more days than I can count uh, as a child at the public library, hours gathering up books, taking them home, and reading them. But the one day of the week that I didn't go to the public library was Saturday. I don't know why I picked Saturday. Uh, as my day of abstinence uh, from the library. But on Saturdays, I went to the drugstore. And the drugstore was two blocks away. And there, amidst the mercurochrome and the Russell Stover's chocolates and the pipe tobacco, I would set, sit on the floor and read the only kind of book I couldn't get at the public library. And those were comics. And as much as I read wildly uh, and omnivorously and indiscriminately uh, at the library, I was the same way with comics. It didn't matter whether they were war comics or Incredible Hulk or Little Lulu. I read them all. Comics were a normal part of my literary experience as a child. Sure, I read the award-winning books that all librarians want little kids to read, and I even liked some of them. I love the folk tales and the poetry my mom read to me at bedtime. But most of all, I looked forward to the comics that I bought at the drugstore with my own allowance, as well as the ones that I competed to be the first to read on Sunday mornings. I always had to race my dad to see you know, which one of us could get the Sunday comics first. My experience isn't all that unusual. I was in my mid-20s, and I was working as a high school librarian thinking about what books I wanted to purchase for that library's collection before I even started to realize how odd it was that I had to go to a drugstore, a drugstore, not a library, to get some of my most favorite childhood reading. You know, it wasn't really until a little more than a decade ago that libraries and librarians began paying attention to comics. That is, pay attention in a good way. The result is that kids these days don't have to do what I did. They don't have to go sit on the floor of a drugstore to read comics. They can go to a media center in their elementary schools. They can go to their branch at a large urban public library. They can even go to the university library on the next block and find comics on the shelves there for their reading. <coughs> comics are not some new medium. Newspapers began publishing things that look a lot like modern comic strips more than a century ago, in the 1890s. By the early 1900s, parents could purchase for their kids collections of comic strips, whether it was Buster Brown or Happy Hooligan, and they could give them as Christmas gifts or birthday gifts, whatever the case may be. The comics business continued to grow, and by the 1930s, kids could follow the exploits of their favorite comic strip characters in the pages of big little books. And by the end of the 1930s, they could read something entirely new. They could read comic books. Kids have loved comics almost from the beginning. For instance, letters from young readers that were published in the LA Times as early as 1909 tell about boys and girls who hustled just like I did as a kid to be the first ones in their homes to read the Sunday comic supplements. By the mid-1940s, surveys indicated that more than 95% of America's elementary-aged young people read comic books regularly. Not just one or two comic books, but maybe a dozen comic books a week, sometimes 40 comic books a week or more. It didn't matter whether it was Superman, Donald Duck, Westerns, Archie, they all were extraordinarily popular. 
By the early 1950s, kids, and undoubtedly some grown-ups as well, purchased almost one billion new comic books each year just in this country. That's just new comics. That didn't include all of the used comics that kids were busy selling and trading with one another behind the scenes. That's the equivalent today of more than seven new comics sold for each person in this country uh, in a single year. So that's a lot of comics that were being sold. And not only were there a lot of comics sold, but there were a lot to choose from, more than 600 different titles, many of them published monthly. As popular as comics were, young people almost never encountered them in libraries and seldom in schools. When they did happen to find a picture of Superman at the library, and there were pictures of Superman at some libraries, it was likely because the librarian was hoping to use his image to lure kids to read something better. If a young person heard about comics at school, it was likely in the context of improving discrimination in reading taste. For decades, the gatekeepers of children's reading, especially librarians, worked really hard to keep comics out of kids' hands. Librarians in Seattle in the early 1900s were quite pleased with themselves because when they got the Sunday newspaper, before they would put the Sunday newspaper out for people to read at the library, they would pull out the comic supplement and toss it into the furnace. They thought that was a good option because the comic supplement would attract the wrong people into the library. It would create too much raucousness and noise and, you know, it was bad for kids anyway. In the 1940s, a librarian wrote in a, a prominent professional journal that librarians across the country really should be working with their state and local legislature, le legislators to enact laws that would restrict the sale of comics to minors. In the 1950s, one of my predecessors here at the Graduate Library School at the University of Illinois published a two-part radio script about all of the ill effects comics reading had on young people. And the American Library Association, which today is a staunch advocate of protecting and promoting people's freedom to read and to explore new ideas, they were silent in 1954 when a subcommittee of the United States Senate's Judiciary Committee encouraged the erroneous correlation that comics reading uh, was a promoter of juvenile delinquency. Many adults feared that comic books had grown too coarse and violent, and in some ways they had. But whatever had happened, comics publishers felt the need to implement a restrictive editorial code in 1955. Readership plummeted. Some publishers went out of business. In fact, a lot of publishers went out of business. And beginning in that year, comics no longer featured particularly prominently in the reading lives of young people. So what? Why does this history lesson matter? Why does any of what I've just told you matter? Well, I think it matters because we squandered a rich opportunity. Think about it for just a second. More than 95% of kids in this country read comics on a regular basis. That's a higher percentage than kids who play video games today. That's a higher percentage than kids who text each other on their cell phones every day. And that's a much higher percentage of kids than who visit the public library any day. It wasn't just librarians and other well-meaning adults who acted stupidly. For a while, the comics industry itself largely abandoned younger readers. And so between the 1960s and the late 1990s, most innovation in comics were aimed at adult audiences. Once upon a time, 12-year-olds, whether girls or boys, black, white, or brown, rich or poor, may have been typical comic readers, but not today. Today, the typical comics reader is a white male in his late 20s with lots of disposable income. Today, some girls read comics, but it's not the gender-neutral experience it was half a century ago. In the past several years, some comics 
creators and publishers have attempted to reconnect with a younger audience. One of the highest profile endeavors is Art Spiegelman and Francois Mouly's Tune Books. They publish books uh, in the Little Lit series, and they publish books like Otto's Orange Day and Little Mouse, which are comics format books for beginning readers. I think it matters because reading comics, really reading comics is a complex task that can go a long way toward developing the kind of critically multiliterate young people that we need for today's society and today's economy. Because just as with any other form of reading, comics reading can improve vocabulary growth. It can promote increased, uh, increased fluency in reading uh, and decoding textual meaning and it can promote increased comprehension. The images are important too. Without any doubt, they contribute to a reader's understanding of the text. But as comic artist Scott McCloud, who was a TED speaker himself a few years ago, has demonstrated, it's the gutter, the empty space between the panels that is the place where readers really have to use their imaginations. They have to use their abilities to draw inferences and make predictions. It's the gutter that really moves a comic forward. In comics, the way creators use panels, frames, gutters, balloons, and even topography are as important as, uh, to the overall narrative as the words themselves. That means that by reading comics, young people can learn how multiple symbol systems can work together to communicate ideas and tell stories. It also matters because of those ideas that comics communicate and those stories comics tell. You can still find plenty of superheroes and funny animals in comics, but you can also find comics that tell about life in places like Iran, Palestine, and North Korea. You can read comics that tell stories about real life superheroes like Harry Houdini and the logician Bertrand Russell, who spent much of his life searching for the logical foundations of mathematics. You can find comics that explore complex issues like bigotry, peer pressure, sexual abuse, and suicide. You can still find other comics that tell stories set in rich fantasy worlds filled with noble intelligent mice or that bring the Trojan War to new life. I believe that kids need comics. I've heard from artists who found their early inspirations in the pages of comic books. Parents have told me about how their children learned to read from the pages of Spider-Man. There are teachers who are using comics in the classrooms to get boys who aren't interested in anything else to read. Comics can nurture and create readers. I hope you'll make time to let your local libraries know that you're glad they have comics available for kids to read. I hope you'll consider giving comics as gifts to the young people in your lives. I hope you'll support the publishers who are reaching out and once again publishing comics for a younger audience. Let's not squander a second chance at this. Thank you.